I just want to start by making a remark about what we've seen in the last session about the RSA crypto system. And actually, this also applies to El Gamal as well. So when we were talking about the security guarantees, and especially when I was talking about one-time pad, there was this idea that a one-time pad basically gives you no information about the message. So if you remember, the idea was that I had a message M and I had some key K and then the encryption of M using K was just K XORed with M. Or we also saw that we can add K to M as long as we are doing the addition module or some other number. Okay. Now, at that point, I told you that an eavesdropper, Eve, who's seeing the encryption, can have no information about the message. Right. So if I say Eve knows the result of the encryption, so whatever was sent in encrypted form. And let's say that she also knows, of course, our algorithm. This is always the case. I, I just don't write it anymore. I'm always assuming that our algorithms are public. So if Eve knows the encryption of a message, she can find no information about the message itself. In other words, we actually had perfect security or perfect privacy, whatever you want to call it. And when I was defining this, I basically said that she cannot rule out any of the messages, right? That was the definition that we gave. So she cannot rule out any message M prime. Because the idea was that if you just see the encryption of a particular message, there is no way you can know what the key was. So there is no way you can know what the message was and every message is possible. So this was the great property of one-time pad. It basically leaked no information at all. But of course, it also came at a cost. We couldn't use one-time pad more than once. We had to change our key every time. But I just want you to see that this property does not hold when we talk about RSA or when we talk about El Gamal for that purpose. So let's see what happens at RSA. Okay, so if I have RSA, we saw before that we have two keys, right? I had an encryption key or a public key E. This was my public key. And I had a decryption key D, which was also my secret key. I use these words interchangeably. And when I wanted to encrypt the message M, so the result of the encryption uh, using the key E of a message M, was simply m raised to the power of e. And of course, we are doing all of these things, all of these calculations, modulo sum n, and this n is also public. Okay, so I have an n, which is my modulus. Now, again, consider the same scenario as before. Let's say that I'm Eve, and I know the result of the encryption because I'm, I'm looking at the channel, I'm seeing a message that is going to Alice, this message is encrypted. So I know the result of the encryption, which is basically M to the power of E. Okay. Now, if I know M to the power of E, basically I argued that it's really hard to find M itself even though I know E and N, right? So Eve knows M to the power of E. She knows E because E was public. She knows N because the modulus was also public. 
but I was saying it's really hard to find M itself. That's kind of true, but on the other hand, it's not too hard to find some information about M if you think about it. If I define finding information as the ability to rule out some messages, I can definitely rule out some messages here. I can take any particular message. Let's say I take M prime. So, or since we're talking about if she takes M prime, and computes m prime to the power of e. So basically what's happening here is that Eve can say, let me guess, maybe the message is m prime. Let me encrypt m prime and see if it was my message. And if this m prime to the power of e is not m to the power of e, which is the most likely case, then she can rule out M prime. She can be sure that my message M is not the same as the M prime that she tried, right? Then M prime is ruled out. Now, why is this significant? Because actually I'm leaking some information, right? So previously when I was doing one time pad, there was no way that Eve could rule out even one message. But now she can actually brute force a bunch of messages and try to encrypt them and see if they have the right encryption. And if they don't have the right encryption, she can just rule them out and say, this is definitely not the message. So in a sense, we are going to a lower level of security. Instead of saying that, the adversary if cannot rule out any messages, cannot find any information about my message. I'm just saying she cannot find any useful information about my message. So she can brute force a bunch of messages, for example, but none of that is going to help her because my message space is so large, my N is so large, it's like thousands of digits long, that it doesn't matter if she just rules out a bunch of messages. It's it's still not giving her any useful information in a sense. So what I want to just emphasize here is that we are changing the definition and we're saying that this RSA does not leak any useful information. So it is leaking something, it's just not useful. Now, in this course, I'm going to leave it at that and I'm going to be very hand wavy about it, but actually we have a, a postgraduate course called Cryptography and Security, and there you will see a, a much more mathematically exact definition of what RSA uh, wants to guarantee. But for now, I just want you to have this difference in mind. Like when I'm doing one time pad, I'm really not leaking any information at all. I'm not even leaking useless information. But when I'm doing RSA or when I'm doing El Gamal, I am actually leaking some information. It's just that no one knows how to use that information. So it's not useful. Okay, so this was the first point. The second point I want you to see about uh, the comparisons we make between, let's say, RSA and one time pad is this idea of reusing the key. Okay. So, what happens if I reuse my key? Well, I have to actually kind of tell you what I mean by reusing the key. And here, what I mean is that I'm using the same key for encryption of more than one message. So in the case of one time pad, we saw that this was actually kind of catastrophic, right? So if I have a one time pad, let's say with a particular key with key K and the key was supposed to be a secret. So here's the thing. I sent two messages, M1 and M2. And again, these messages are secret. So 
I have M1 and M2, and these are my messages. And basically I send them in encrypted form. So here I would have M1 XOR with K. Here I would have M2 XOR with K. Now the problem is that the adversary Eve can just compute the XOR of these two messages, right? So this is what Eve can compute. She can take the XOR of these two and well, in, in, this, in, in this XOR, actually the case cancel out. So she will just get M1 XOR with M2. And this is pretty terrible because now basically she has gone around our uh, whole encryption. Like my key K does not even appear here. I've now leaked some really important information, which was the XOR of two messages. And you can imagine that if these two messages were words or sentences in English, then Eve can probably look into a dictionary and try to find out what words have this particular XOR, right? And then she can decode it basically, or decrypt it. Now, what happens if I use RSA with the same key? So I have RSA, I have, of course, a key pair, and my key pair is that I have a public key E, and I have a private key D. Okay, and just as before, let's say I have two messages, I have M1 and M2. So for example, let's say I'm Alice and two different people are sending me messages. Bob wants to send me M1, Carol wants to send me M2. Now what happens? Well, Bob actually encrypts M1 and send it to me. So what, what he sends me is M1 to the power of E. Again, modulo N, I'm not going to write that. And here, Carol also sends M2 to the power of E. Now, what can Eve compute? Again, our security assumption is that Eve cannot really find any useful information about either M1 or M2. But one thing she can definitely do is that she can just multiply these two encrypted forms. So she can get M1 to the power of E multiplied by M2 to the power of E. And this one would just be M1, M2 to the power of E. Okay. Now this is not nothing, but it doesn't seem to be very useful because now you have the multiplication of the two messages, but you have that also in an encrypted form. And if you kind of don't know how to decrypt, it doesn't really help you to have this multiplication here. So again, I just want you to see the intuition here. I'm not making any exact mathematical statements. I'm just saying that intuitively, if I reuse my key in a one-time pad, I actually leaked a lot of useful information that someone could use to decrypt my messages. But if I use the same key in RSA several times, it doesn't seem like I'm giving up any useful information. Again, I'm. Uh, I'm leaking some information, but no one knows how to use this, okay? Because the encryption kind of stands there, like if you want to look at it from a very hand wavy point of view. But this is actually what we call uh, the homomorphic property of RSA. And we will see that it becomes much more important later on. So what is the homomorphic property? It's this very simple idea that if I encrypt using the same key, some message M1, and then if I encrypt 
again using the same key, another message M2. And if I multiply these two encryptions, I will get the encryption of M1 times M2. So I can do the multiplication after I do encryption, or I can do the multiplication before I do encryption, and I will get the same results. And this is basically the same as saying M1 to the power of E times M2 to the power of E is just M1, M2, all of it to the power of E. Okay. So in terms of reusing the key, in practice, we would never reuse the key with one-time pad. That's why we call it a one-time pad. But with RSA, we reuse our keys all the time. Uh, but again, by reusing my key, I don't mean that I use it for different purposes. I just mean that I use it with different messages. So different people can send me messages using the same key. Okay. Now I want to finally get to the main point of this session, which is digital signatures. So We've talked about this at the very first session when we were talking about cryptographic primitives and what kind of uh, things we want to be able to do. So one of the things that I like to replicate from the real world into the digital world is the idea of signatures. Now, what, what is a signature? Let's try to find the definition first. Okay, so again, let's say that I have Alice and I have Bob. This is my setting all the time. And let's say that Alice wants to send a message to Bob over the internet. Okay, but now I have a different type of adversary here. Uh, so uh, maybe I shouldn't call it Eve anymore. I don't know. I'm going to call this adversary Charlie. Now, what Charlie does is that he can actually change the messages that Alice is sending. So previously, when we were talking about Eve, Eve would just try to figure out what the message is. And the idea was that well, as Alice, I would just encrypt my messages, maybe with Bob's public key, or maybe I do a key exchange. And then I would be happy. I can send messages to Bob that uh, the adversary cannot read. But now I have a situation where I have an adversary, and this adversary can actually change my messages. So now from Bob's point of view, the problem is I've received a message. The message claims to be from Alice, but how can I be sure? How can I know that this was actually a message by Alice? Now, if we want to be uh, very pessimistic about this, we can say that suppose I have both types of adversaries. So maybe I want to send some secret messages and maybe the adversary can also change my messages. So now I have a bunch of problems because maybe I sent two messages to Alice, let's say using RSA, and then the adversary does this. So maybe Charlie does not deliver, let's say again, Charlie is my internet service provider. He has complete control over what kind of messages I send and receive. And let's say I send the message M1 and I send the message M2, but Charlie just uh, takes these two encrypted messages, multiplies them and sends the multiplication to Alice, right? So how can Alice possibly know that I didn't send M1 times M2, I actually sent M1 and M2 separately? Or basically he can change my messages in any way. And he can also change the messages that Alice is sending to me in any way. and that becomes really hard really soon, because if you think about it, we had this idea of um, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And if I have a Charlie here who can read all of my messages and who can change them as well, and let's say now I'm Alice, from my point of view as Alice, I cannot really do key exchange with Bob. 
right? Because if I'm trying to do a key exchange with Bob, I have no idea if I'm actually communicating with Bob or I'm just communicating with Charlie. It might be that Charlie is intercepting all of my messages, not delivering them to Bob, and maybe he's just uh, copying Bob. So he's simulating what Bob would do in Diffie-Hellman. So as Alice, I think that I'm exchanging uh, a key with Bob, but I'm actually exchanging my key with Charlie. Right, this is called a man in the middle attack. But uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's just look at this particular problem here. So let's say I have Alice, I have Bob. Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Bob does not trust that the message was actually from Alice. Bob has to make sure that the message was not changed. And now our issue is not really to keep the message secrets because that's an orthogonal issue. So if Alice wants the message to also be secret, she can encrypt it using Bob's public key. But that's not what I want to do here. I just want to make sure that uh, the message is really from Alice. So I don't care about privacy here. I care about the message not being tampered with. Okay. So what do I want to do? Well, Alice has a message M and now this M is not private. It's just some message. And she can't just send M to Bob. She has to also send a signature on M. So she should be able to send M and some signature, I show it like this, over M. And the idea is that when Bob receives this signature, he should be able to make sure that this signature really came from Alice, right? So only Alice should be able to create this signature, but anyone else, including Bob, should be able to verify this signature. Okay, so this is what we want. And if I want to give a formal definition, I would like to have a signature function and I'm going to just call this SGN. And this signature function is going to take strings and give me strings, right? So it just takes a message M and gives me a signature on M. Okay. Now, just as before, just like the case of encryption and decryption, I want my signature to work based on some key, okay? And of course, this is a key that only Alice is supposed to have. So I'm going to show the key using D because that was the notation that we used for our secret key. So remember our secret key was called D before. So I'm going to have a signature function that signs using the secret key D. And then of course I should have a verification function And the idea of the verification function is that it just verifies if a particular signature is valid. So I'm going to just call this VER for verification. And in order to do verification, I need, sorry, wrong color. I need the public key E. But what do I really verify? I have some string and I have a signature on it. And I just verify if that signature is correct or not. So zero means the signature did not pass. One means the signature was correct. Okay. So these are the two things that I need. So I need to make sure that only Alice can sign. That's why my signature function has this uh, dependence on the secret key D. So I'm assuming that Alice has a secret key D and I'm assuming that there is also a public key E that, that is known to everyone. Okay. Now, what are the properties that I want to have? 
So first I need the validity property as before. And the validity property is that if I sign something and then someone else verifies it, it should pass the verification, right? So I should be able to say, if I have some message M and Alice signs this message using D. And then Bob wants to verify this. So Bob takes M and the signature and tries to verify it using E. This verification should always pass. This is for every message. Okay. So for every message M, if I first sign it correctly using the correct key, and then I try to verify the signature using the correct key, I should uh, pass the verification. Now, sometimes people define the verification function a little bit differently. And instead of saying that the verification function takes the message and the signature on the message and just tells us whether the signature is correct or not, sometimes people say the verification function, uh, I'm going to use a bar here just takes the signature and gives back the original message. That's also fine because if I have this type of verification, I also have this type and vice versa, right? So if I have this type of verification and I just uh, give it some signature and let's say it tells me what was the original message that was signed using the signature, then of course, if I have a message, I can just check if this is the same message. So if I want to write it using this kind of definition, then I can say that for every message M, if I first sign my message using D, and this is what Alice does, and then, if I send this signature to Bob and Bob verifies it using E, this should give me my original message back. Okay. So this is of course the validity property that we want, but what are the other properties that I like to have? Well, first of all, I want you to see that my signature actually depends on the message that I'm signing. And this is very different from real world signatures. So in the real world, when you're signing a document, you're always using the same signature. But here actually the signature is a function of the document or the message that you're signing. Now that has a very trivial reason because if the signature was not a function of what I'm signing, if the signature was just some fixed uh, string, let's say, or some fixed file, then it wouldn't prove anything, right? I could just change this M and use the same signature. So the first time I use my signature, it loses all of its power because anyone who has seen my signature can now copy it. So it's actually quite important that my signature is not just a fixed signature, it's actually a function of the message or the document that I'm signing. So that's one important difference. But I also want to make sure that only I can sign, or in this case, only Alice can sign. Okay, so that's my security property. And let me write it with this color. My security property is that only Alice can sign. But what does this mean? This means that if you just consider an adversary who doesn't know the secret key D, 
that adversary should not be able to create a signature. So if Charlie knows, okay, what does Charlie know? So I have Charlie here and he's the kind of adversary who wants to create fake messages. He wants to send a message to Bob and claim that this was from Alice. Now, there are a bunch of things here that are public. So Charlie knows M, for example. So this is the message that he wants to fake. And he also knows E, this is the public key. And let's say that he also knows these functions. He knows how the signatures work and how the verifications work because we don't hide our algorithms. Okay. He should still not be able to forge a signature. So if Charlie knows all of these things, he should not be able to compute a signature on M, to compute a signature using D on M. And of course, the point here is that he doesn't know D, okay? So maybe I can be very specific about it, but not D. So if I'm someone who has a message and knows the public key of Alice and knows how the signature and verification functions work, I should not be able to forge a signature. Or another way of looking at this is that if I'm Bob, and I see a valid signature on a message from Alice, I should be able to uh, be completely sure that this actually came from Alice. Okay. So any questions until this point? If you have any questions, please just write in the chat and also don't wait for me to ask you to ask your questions. Just write in the chat whenever you have a question. Okay, but now this is actually quite similar to the case of public key cryptography that we saw before. And actually that's also the reason why I'm using D and E here. So let's see. On the one hand, we had public key cryptography which was, for example, RSA and El Gamal, as we saw last time. And on the other hand, we have digital signatures. And this is what we're talking about in this, se in this session, okay? So what did I have in my public key crypto? I had a secret key and I called it D, right? And this was used for decryption because the idea was that only Alice should be able to decrypt the messages. So remember the setting was that Alice had uh, published her public key and then anyone could encrypt and send her a message, but only she could use it, use her, secret key to decrypt. Okay. And there was also, let me just turn this into a table kind of. Okay. There was also a public key E, which was used for encryption. And so very simply put, the idea was that everyone can encrypt but only Alice can decrypt. Okay. Now, what happens in the case of digital signatures as I defined them here? 
I'm saying that again, Alice has a private key D and a public key E. Okay. So there is a secret key D. But what is this key used for? It's used for signing. Right, and then there is a public key. This is E, which is used for verification. And just like this case, I have a situation where only Alice can sign because I don't want anyone to be able to forge Alice's signature. So only Alice can sign using her secret key D, but everyone can verify the signature. Everyone can verify. So of course you see why I'm creating this table. Basically the idea is that signing is pretty much like decryption and verification is pretty much like encryption. And actually, we have this even when it comes to the validity properties and the security properties. So what does this validity property mean? I'm saying that if Alice first signs and then I want to verify it, I should get the same message, right? So it's a little bit different in the sense that before we, we said that if I have a message and I first encrypt it and then decrypt it, I should get the same message back. But now here, what I'm saying is that if I have a message and I first sign it and then verify it, I have to get the same message back. But the problem is in the order, right? So. If I want to say that a signature is basically like a decryption, then here I'm saying if I decrypt first and then encrypt, I should get my original message. So this property is a little bit different. But if you remember the way that we did RSA, in RSA, the encryption and the decryption were basically the same. So if I wanted to encrypt a message, I would just raise it to the power of my key. If I wanted to decrypt a message, I would also raise it to the power of my key. The difference was that for encryption, I used the public key. For decryption, I used the secret key. So basically, when it comes to RSA, I can really have this exact same uh, kind of uh, relationship or correspondence between decryption and signing on the one hand and encryption and verification on the other hand, okay? So this is what I'm going to do. Let's say RSA signatures, and let's see what we can do. So I'm going to say Alice creates keys just like before. So my first step is that Alice creates RSA keys. So basically, she is creating a modulus n, which was supposed to be, remember, p times q, where p and q were really large prime numbers. She's going to find some number e, and this was the public key. She's going to also find a number D, and this was the private key. And the property that we wanted before was that for every message M, M to the power of ED is equal to M modulo N. And we saw how to do this in the last session. So I know that I can create RSA keys like this, okay? 
And again, in practice, if you don't remember that, it's fine. You, you just need to know this property. So you can just call a library. It will give you uh, some good numbers that satisfy this property. OK. So Alice creates these RSA keys. And of course, as usual, she announces somehow N and E. Or actually, instead of saying she announces this, let's just say that we assume everyone knows. So we assume everyone knows the modulus N and the public key E. OK. Now I have to define how my signature works. And I have to define how my verification works. OK. So I'm going to say that my signature is basically just decryption. So I'm going to say the signature of Alice using her private key D on a message M. And here, my message is no longer a secret, right? I'm going to just define this to be the same as the decryption, the RSA decryption using D of the same message M. I have to change colors so many times. OK, and what was decryption? Well, decryption was just that I take this message and I raise it to this power, to the power of my key. So this is just m to the power of t. So if I want to sign something, I just raise it to the power of d, and d was just a secret that only I know, only Alice knows. OK, this is my signature. Now, what next? So let's say Bob wants to verify. So I can say Alice computes this. And she sends it to Bob. Of course, she also sends the original message M. So remember, here's my situation, I'm sending M and I'm also sending my signature on M, both of them to Bob. So now Bob receives something. He's receiving an M and a signature on M, but he's not sure if this is really from Alice. So he has to verify the signature. And the idea here is that if Charlie has changed the message M, he could not create a signature on the new message, so the signature would not pass the verification. And so if the signature passes the verification, Bob can be sure that the message was from Alice. But how can Bob uh, figure out how to verify? So Bob verifies Alice's signature. And basically, I want verification to be the same as RSA encryption. So what he computes is quite simply, OK, let's give a name to this. Let's call this S. So let's say that the signature that Bob received is S. It's supposed to be M to the power of D. Right, but Bob does not know M and does not know D. Bob knows M, but he does not know D. So he, he just knows M and S at this point. And he wants to verify that S is a valid signature on M. Okay, so what he does is that he just calls the verification function using the public key E on the signature S. Right, and I'm going to again say that the verification function is just the same as my encryption function. So it's just the encryption using E of S. 
And as we saw before in RSA, the encryption, it was basically the same as the decryption. <coughs> it's just that you take whatever parameter you have and you raise it to the power of your key. So this is just going to give me S to the power of E, right? And then Bob checks, he checks, is this the same as M? If this is the same as M, then Bob agrees that the message was actually signed by Alice. If this is not the same as M, then Bob rejects the message and he says, oh, Charlie has changed my message. Okay, but why does this work? So the reason is that if S is really Alice's signature, Of course, Alice's signature on M. Then S was calculated like this. So S is M to the power of D. So when Bob wants to verify it, he gets M to the power of D to the power of E because he raises S to the power of E. And the way that D and E were chosen, we know that this would be equal to M modulo M. Right. So if it is really Alice's signature, if Alice really approved the message M, then this verification would work and Bob would be sure that the message is actually from Alice. Okay. So this is the whole thing. This is called RSA signatures. So it's exactly like RSA encryption. The only difference is that I'm giving new names to stuff. Instead of saying I'm decrypting, I'm saying I'm signing. Instead of saying I'm encrypting, I'm saying I'm verifying the signature, right? The only difference is really in the order of the operations. So previously what happened was if Bob wanted to send a message to Alice, Bob would first encrypt and then send the encrypted message to Alice and Alice would decrypt it. Now it's the opposite. Alice wants to send a message to Bob. She first signs the message and signing is the same as decryption. And so she sends this result of decryption to Bob and then Bob verifies it, which is the same as encryption. So now I have decryption first and encryption second but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day because in RSA, I have the same kind of algorithm. It's just, I take my parameter, raise it to the power of my key for both decryption and encryption. Okay, now let's see. Do I have the validity property? So this is actually the validity property, right? So I'm saying that if I take a valid signature and I verify it, I just raise it to the power of E, I will get my original message back. Now, the only difference really between here and what we had in RSA encryption is again the, the order, right? So previously what I did was that I Bob wanted to encrypt the message, he would raise it to the power of E. And then afterwards, Alice would raise the result to the power of D. Here, Alice is first raising the message to the power of D. And then afterwards, Bob is raising it to the power of E. But it doesn't matter. M to the power of D E is the same as M to the power of E D. So yeah, the validity property definitely holds. Now, how about the other property, the security property. So what does Charlie know? Charlie knows everything that was communicated. So Charlie knows actually the message here because the message itself was not private and Alice actually sent the message over the channel. He also knows uh, the message to the power of D, right? This is the signature basically. 
he knows N, he knows E, because that was public, but he does not know P, Q, or D, okay? So these are the things that Charlie knows. Can he somehow use this information to forge a signature on a different message? And as you see, this goes back to the RSA assumption, actually. Because what is forging a signature? So I'm going to claim that Charlie knows these things. And maybe he even knows this for several messages, but cannot forge a signature. Now, why is that? Because basically to forge a signature, on some new message, so let's say on M prime, Charlie must compute M prime to the power of D. But M prime to the power of D is basically the same as decrypting M prime in the RSA uh, crypto system of the last session, right? So if he can forge, if he can forge this signature, this means that he could decrypt, which means that we are violating the RSA security assumption from last session, which said that uh, an eavesdropper cannot decrypt, okay? So to forge a signature, Charlie must compute M prime to the power of D, which is the same as decryption. Which we assumed is impossible. Which the RSA assumption rules out. So that's the kind of security that we have here. And again, I'm very hand wavy. You can take the postgraduate course we have on cryptography to get a much more mathematically precise picture. I just want you to understand the main ideas here because this is not really a cryptography course. This is a cryptocurrencies course. So we just want to use these things later on. All I want you to see here is that since signing is the same as decryption and verifying is the same as encryption, everyone can verify because encryption was something that everyone could do before, but no one can forge a signature because forging a signature is like decrypting and only Alice could decrypt. So only Alice can create a signature. Okay. But now we have a problem. And the problem is actually the same points that I mentioned here, and that's the homomorphic property of RSA. So if you look at the homomorphic property of RSA, I said, if I encrypt M1 and then I encrypt M2, and I multiply these two together, I get the result of the encryption of M1 times M2. But this also holds for the decryption, because remember, the Encryption and decryption in RSA were basically the same. It was just that we were using different keys, right? So if I write the homomorphic property here, I have a problem. So let's say that I'm Alice and I sign two different messages, okay? So let's say Alice signs both M1 and M2. And let's say she sends these signatures to Bob or publishes them. I don't really care. All I care about is that the adversary here, Charlie, will see these signatures, okay? 
So she sends her signature on M1 and her signature on M2 to Bob. And these signatures were made using the secret kitty. Okay, but what are these signatures? Based on the definition that we had here, this is just, again, raising to the power. So this is M1 to the power of T, and this one is M2 to the power of T. So now Charlie knows both M1 to the power of T and M2 to the power of T. So Charlie knows both of these. So he can now just multiply them, right? So he computes the multiplication, which is just M1, M2 to the power of T. But now I have a problem. This is a signature on a new message on M1, M2, right? But this, is a signature on M1 times M2. Or if I want to say it in more general terms, I can generally say that for every M1 and M2, if I take my signature on M1 and I multiply it by my signature on M2, I have my signature on M1, M2. This is my homomorphic property. And of course, all of these signatures have to be with the same key. Now, this is a problem because Alice actually just signed M1 and M2. So if you think of signing as some sort of approval and well, as we will see later on, the idea is that when I sign M1, M1 is maybe a transaction and I'm maybe saying that you can take M1 units of my money and M2 is another transaction. Now, if someone can just put these together and get a signature on M1 times M2, that's actually very problematic. So how do I avoid this? There's no way to stop Charlie from finding a signature on M1 times M2 because that's just baked in. It's like, as long as I'm using RSA signatures, I have this homomorphic property. But what I can do for sure is that I can make sure if this happens, M1 times M2 is a garbage message. It's a message that doesn't mean anything. Now, how would I actually do that? And this is where we use hashing. So the very simple idea, but very important. So simple and important is that you never sign a message or a document. You always sign its hash, okay? Never. sign a message M, always sign the hash of M. Okay. So there is a question in the chat. Can we let Bob choose the message M and then let Alice sign it? Yes, we can have situations like that as well. But in this particular scenario, Alice is the one who's sending the message. So uh, I want uh, everything to come from Alice, both the message and the signature. But generally there is nothing to stop Alice from signing whatever she wants to sign. So it might be that Bob gives her first some uh, particular string and asks her to sign. Okay. But anyway, I want to really focus on this point. You never sign a message itself. You always sign the hash of the message. Now, why is that? Just because of this homomorphic property. 
right? So if instead of the messages, I had their hashes. So instead of signing M1, I've signed the hash of M1. And instead of signing M2, I've signed the hash of M2. Now, someone can use the homomorphic property or any other property that looks like this, and maybe they get a signature on the hash of M1 times the hash of M2. But this is just a signature on some garbage, right? This is not a real thing because you cannot find another message. Remember, you cannot invert the hash function. So this is just some garbage and you cannot find the message such that its hash is this garbage. So you are finding a signature if you do an attack like this, but the signature that you find is not on anything meaningful. So it can easily be detected. And then the verification is actually quite easy. So if I want to do this verification here, instead of doing the verification and then checking that I get M back, I just check that I get the hash of M back. So a simple hashing makes it so that the verification does not change much. I can still verify a signature. So Intuitively, the idea is that it doesn't matter if I'm saying I agree with this particular file or if I say I agree with a file that has this particular hash. No matter which one I sign, I'm agreeing to the same thing. So I can always change my protocol and I can always say that I sign the hashes, right? And here I get the hash back and I can, again, just check that it, it is the right hash. But the important point here is that I will not be vulnerable to attacks by homomorphism. So it wouldn't happen that someone can take two of my signatures and somehow manipulate them to get another signature. They can get some other signature on a piece of garbage, but that's not useful to them at all. Okay. So just keep this in mind. You should always first hash and then sign. Okay, now finally, we are ready to go back to a scenario that we saw before. So let's look at the bank with two branches again. So remember this scenario, and this was something that we talked about before we got into encryption and we just had hashes and so on. And the scenario was this, I, I had two branches of a bank. So I had a Hong Kong branch here. And I had another branch, let's say I had the Shanghai branch here. And people would come to this branch and make some deposits. So I had a bunch of people, Alice making some deposit some amount of money, let's call it M1. Bob would put down M2 units of money. I had maybe Carol, M3, and so on. And I wanted them to be able to receive their money from the other side. And the idea was that I can send one short message from this branch to that branch. And this message was also not sent on a particularly secure channel. So I wanted it to not really matter if this message was revealed. So I wanted to make sure that when I send this one short message from my Hong Kong branch to my Shanghai branch, uh, everything works fine. So even if this message is revealed, even if this is leaked, I don't want it to have any privacy implications for the people here. And then we said that whenever Alice makes, for example, a deposit of M1, 
we give her some proof. Let's say P of Alice or just P1. So this is a string that she can use to get her money back from the other side. And when Bob makes a deposit, he gets a proof. When Carol makes a deposit, she gets a proof as well. Now, previously, our solution was that we take all of these deposits, all of these records, and we put them into a Merkle tree. And then we would send the root of the Merkle tree, the hash of the root of the Merkle tree from Hong Kong to Shanghai. And then each proof was basically proving the entire path in the Merkle tree. So the problem there was that even though the message that I sent here had constant lengths. So this one had a length of 01 because it was just a hash. Each one of my proofs was actually quite long. It was log n in length. And last time we were happy when we got to log n because we started with a different data structure that gave us linear proofs. And then when we could find logarithmic proofs, we were super happy. But now having these signatures, I can actually have proofs of constant lengths as well. So I'm going to make both the proof and the short message that is sent from Hong Kong to Shanghai to have O1 lengths. Now, how can I do that? Well, first let's talk about this short message. This short message would just be my public key E and my modulus N. Okay, that's all I sent. Now, if I just send my public key and my modulus to the other branch, then the other branch is able to verify any signature that is made by this branch. So when Alice deposits M1 units of money in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong branch just creates a record. Okay, so what is that record? It's something like this. It says like Alice and I mean, you can think about your own encoding. I would like something like this. I would say Alice, so her name. I would put a number, so maybe one. This is like the first deposit of today. And then I would put another divider and I would say the amount is M1. So this is the message. Okay. And then I can also put a nonce because it's a good practice to put a nonce whenever you want to hash. And then I would hash this. Okay. And then I would sign it. So, and then the proof that I give to Alice is basically this nonce and this entire signature, right? Now, Alice can go to the other bank. She can go, sorry, to the other branch. She can go to Shanghai and she can just say, my name is Alice. I So I just give all of this information. Let's say I give all of this information to Alice and I give this signature to Alice as well. Okay, so let's call this one, I don't know, let's call this one A and this one S, since this is a signature. So P1 is just going to be A and S. So she takes this to, to the other branch. Now, the other branch first checks that A is a well-formed string, so it has the correct format. It's the name, the number of the deposit, the amount of the deposit, and, uh, and some nonce that Alice is giving them, right? But then they have to check that it has the right signature from Hong Kong. Now, in order to check that, they first hash this A, and they get the hash of A, so this hash inside here. And then they just verify this signature S. They verify that this is a valid signature of Hong Kong on that hash. And if it's the right signature, then they will pay us. That's it, very simple. So now I solved the problem of 
uh, my bank with two branches very easily. And then actually when Bob makes a deposit, I give him a similar signature and so on. So I just create similar signatures and, and similar proofs for anyone who makes a deposit. Now, another really nice benefit here is that each one of these proofs is completely independent of the other proofs. So previously, when I had this Merkle tree, in order to even make my Merkle tree, I had to wait for everyone to make their deposits. And after everyone made their deposits, I could make my Merkle tree. And then you remember, I had this story that everyone deposits in the morning and then everyone gets their proof in the afternoon. But right now we can do it in real time. As soon as you deposit, you will get your proof because I don't have to wait for the other deposits to create your proof. Your proof is just a signature on the hash of the deposit record. Okay. Nice. But kind of an uneasy point here is that I was assuming in this entire system that Alice has a private key and a public key, and that Bob also knows this public key, right? So we have a problem if Bob doesn't know the public key in the first place. Because you can imagine if Alice and Bob want to communicate with each other and they don't already know each other's public key. So Bob doesn't know Alice's public key. None of this signature idea would work at all. Like, I don't know Alice's public key, so how can I even verify that the message came from him? And actually, that's a problem that we cannot really solve. Because if Alice and Bob have not communicated before, and if their only way of communication is using internet, using the internet, using this channel, and if Charlie can change all the messages in this channel, then Charlie can basically disconnect Alice from Bob. So what Charlie can do is that he does not deliver any of the messages from Bob to Alice or from Alice to Bob. And then he just pretends to be Alice and any kind of key exchange or whatever Bob wants to do, Charlie just imitates Alice. And Bob thinks that uh, he's communicating with Alice, but he's actually communi communicating with a catfish with Charlie. So there is no way to go around this if you don't already share a key. If you do share a key E, then you can do this kind of communication and you can have signatures. Okay. Now, what happens in this particular case? You see, I'm saying that I'm sending this one short message. And in that scenario, I was assuming that this short message cannot be changed. Now, what happens if I'm sending this short message over the internet? Well, that can be changed. Well, in this case, what I can do is I can first have a representative of the Shanghai branch fly to Hong Kong and then they would create the first shared key E. So they will just get it directly from Hong Kong and they will fly back to Shanghai and then they will have that shared E. But as soon as I have one key, as soon as I have E and N for my first day, I don't need to do it uh, ever again because at the end of the day, the Hong Kong branch can just change the key. So let's say at the end of the day, The Hong Kong branch creates the keys for the next day. So let's say it creates, let's call them uh, D prime, E prime and N prime. These are the keys for the next day for tomorrow. And then since we already have the keys for today, the Hong Kong branch can just send the 
public key for tomorrow to Shanghai and it can sign it using the keys of today. So proving that these keys really came from Hong Kong. So Hong Kong sends a message and this message is basically this. It contains E prime, N prime and a signature on them to be more specific. Well, I have to be very careful. I, I have to sign on the hash. And okay, this signature is using today's key. So the last message that I sent today is that, hey, by the way, my keys for tomorrow, my public key for tomorrow and my modulus for tomorrow are going to be these values. And anyway, the other branch could verify my message for today. So they can also verify this. They can verify that this really came from me. So we can change the keys for tomorrow without having to actually meet physically again. But for the first time, the only way that we could really trust that we are sharing the same key was to meet physically. And just the Hong Kong branch gives the key E and N the first time to Shanghai. Okay, but that's good. Like you need just one flight, not too bad. Okay, I again have to talk about the problem of key reuse. So a very important point here is that you should never, ever, ever use the same keys for uh, both signing and encryption. So for both messaging and signing, let's say it like that. Okay, so let's say that again, I have Alice on one side, Okay, let's say I have Alice on one side and I have Bob on the other side. And now let's say that the adversary that I have in between is a mixture of Charlie and Eve. So I want to be able to send messages and I want to verify two things. I want to verify that first of all, the message really came from the other person. And secondly, I want to verify uh, that no one else could understand the message. No one else could decrypt the message. So I want to have encryption and I also want to have digital signatures at the same time. So this is quite easy because I, I can just do both, right? So I can say, Bob, has uh, a public key. Let's show that with E of Bob. This is the public key of Bob. He also has a private key, D of Bob. And he also has a modulus, N of Bob. And Alice has the same things. So she has a public key, a modulus, and a private key. So now if Alice wants to send a message M to Bob and she wants M to be uh, encrypted, well, what she can actually do is that, well, first she takes M and she signs it, right? Because the signature is supposed to show that M really came from Alice. But then she doesn't want to just send this message to Bob because just sending this message is not enough. Uh, Charlie and Eve can actually see this message. So I have M, I have my signature on M and this signature was using D of Alice. I know I'm having too many things here. 
But then I encrypt this whole message and send it to Bob. And of course, I have to encrypt it using the public key of Bob so that Bob can decrypt it. So I first create my message, I then sign it. After I sign it, I encrypt the whole thing and I send this encrypted message to Bob. Now only Bob can decrypt because I encrypted it using Bob's public key. So Bob decrypts it. Now, when he decrypts it, he gets a message and a signature. Uh, but he can verify the signature and only Alice could create the signature. So he can be sure that it came from Alice. But very importantly, Alice should use a different keeper for her signatures than the ones that she uses for receiving messages. Okay. And the reason for that is that if you don't use different keys, if you say, oh, I just have this fixed single public key and fixed single private key, and I use it both for signatures and for receiving messages, every time that you're signing something, you're also decrypting something. So someone can uh, basically fool you into decrypting a message by just asking you to sign it. And you don't want that to happen. So in practice, Alice will sh should also have two private keys and two public keys and two moduli. So one keeper for uh, signing, another keeper for receiving messages. Bob should also have one keeper for signing and another keeper for receiving messages. Okay, that's it for this session and I'll see you soon. And ask any questions you have in the chat. Oh, yes, a good question. The signature should be on the hash of M. Yes, I forgot that. You're right. This is getting really out of hand. We have, we are now combining so many different things. Yes, the signature should be on the hash of M. Okay, how many parentheses is that? Three. Yeah, because we never sign on, a fun, on, on the message itself. We always sign on its hash. Okay, there is a question about homeworks. We will soon have our first homework, probably after the next session when we talk about uh, the centralized ledger. So in the next session, I'm going to talk about how central bank cryptocurrencies work. And then later on, we're going to make them decentralized to get something like Bitcoin. So your first homework will be released after I cover the centralized ledger. Okay, great. Seems like there are no more questions, so see you soon. Bye.